Hi, I'm Fernando Pereira from UFMG and today we shall talk a bit about lattice theory. The goal of this class will be to explain why static analysis terminate. The material used in this class was taken mostly from two sources, the lecture notes of Michael Schwarzbach and also chapter 9 of the Dragon Book. Uh, throughout the class we shall try to provide answers to these two questions. In particular, how do we know that an algorithm that solves data flow equations terminate? And also, how precise is the solution once it terminates? I mean, uh, which kind of information can we expect to obtain from an algorithm that solves a data flow analysis? To answer these two questions, we will learn about an algebraic structure called a lattice. There will be some math notation in this class, but it will not be a lot. At least I don't think it will be a lot. Mostly we'll be focusing on examples. Let's start remembering one of our first data flow analysis, liveness. Can you try to find some of the live sets in this control flow graph? That's just a warm-up example. We will try to provide some intuition on why liveness terminates. If you don't remember the solution of this problem, here it is, our live set. Do you remember the data flow equations that we used to solve liveness? These were the equations to solve liveness. Do you remember them from the class about data flow analysis? These equations fill out in and out sets. They propagate information backward. Remember? And liveness is a may analysis, I mean an analysis that we classify as the may happen type. So we use a union to merge information at joint points in the CFG. And then we also saw that we can repeatedly iterate the evaluation of these equations. We keep solving them until the in and out sets stop changing. At this moment, we say that we've reached a fixed point. But the fundamental question is, why do you know that every in and out set eventually reaches a fixed point? We know that we eventually stabilize for two reasons. First, these equations cannot remove information from either in or out sets. Second, the in and out sets cannot grow forever. Can you reason for a moment on why these two properties are true? Perhaps you can stop the video and think a bit about them. Let me show you another example. This time, let's take a look into available expressions. Do you remember that analysis? An expression is available at some program point if its current value has already been computed before that point and we can reuse it there. If you want to practice, you can compute available expressions in this example before I show the result. For here they are, the available expressions. You can see them on the code on the right side of the figure. Do you remember the equations to compute available expressions? These are the equations. If you want, you can pause the video for a moment and then take a look into the equations. That will help you to follow the rest of the discussion about available expression analysis. Try to think for a moment. Why does the evaluation of these equations eventually terminate? The argument is similar to the one we saw in liveness, but the direction of the reasoning is opposite. In liveness, equations could only increase information in the sets or leave them unchanged. Here, equations can only remove information or again, leave them unchanged. And in the case of liveness, the sets could, in the worst case, contain all the variables in the program. I mean, they cannot really grow forever. In the case of availability, they can, in the worst case, end up empty. And also, they cannot really decrease forever. Let's see. I'm leaving three questions here. Think a bit about them. If you can come up with answers for for these questions, you will see that the evaluation of a system of equations for available expressions will always terminate. 
But instead of reasoning about each particular data flow analysis, we can rely on a theoretical framework to prove that they all terminate. Key to build this theoretical framework is the idea of lattices. A lattice is a partially ordered set with some properties. I shall be describing these properties throughout this class. And do you know what's a partially ordered set? That's just a set with an ordering relation between some elements. Some elements are greater than others, but this relation may not really be defined for every element in the set, so that's why we call it partially ordered. Oh, and a last question. Do you know why a lattice is called a lattice? Actually, do you know what is a lattice? I mean, a lattice like in a house for decoration. Try to leave this question on the top of your stack. Once you get, we get by with lattices, maybe you will understand why they have this name. Let's go over the many parts of the definition of a lattice. First, lattices have least upper bounds. I shall call least upper bounds LUBs for short. So given any two elements of the lattice, there is a single element LUB in the lattice that is greater than both. And any other element greater than our pair will be greater than the LUB of this pair. Perhaps you can pause the video to read the definition. Something important, any subset of a lattice also has a LUB. We can get it by getting the LUB pairwisely of the elements in the subset. But notice that the LUB may not be in the subset itself. And in the same way as we have defined LUBs, we can also define GLBs. These are the greatest lower bounds of pairs of elements. So given any two elements in the lattice, the GLB is an element of the lattice that's less than both. And any other element also less than both is less than the GLB. And notice that we also can define the GLB of a subset of a lattice. We define two operators to compute LUBs and GLBs. To compute GLBs, we have the MIT operator. And to compute the LUB, we have the JOIN operator. These operators have some nice algebraic properties. I'm listing them here, and if you want, you can stop the video and read them over. But just to speed up things, notice that JOIN and MIT have the same properties as addition and multiplication of integers commutativity, associativity, independence, and such and such. And along these lines, something very important, and that's a fundamental property of a lattice, is that join and meet have additive and multiplicative notions of 1 and 0. I mean, the lattice contains an element that, when joined with any other element, is that other element itself. That's the multiplicative 1 for join. Take a look at these relations in this figure to find the zeros and ones that I'm talking about. These elements have names. We call the multiplicative zero of join the top element. Top is also the multiplicative one of meet. It's the largest element in the lattice, and we call the multiplicative one of join the bottom element. A bottom is also the multiplicative zero of meet. It's the least element of the lattice. Notice that most of our data flow analysis do not require all these properties. For instance, as we will see soon in liveness, we use just the join operator, and in available expressions, we use just the meet operator. This analysis actually use semi-lattices. A semi-lattice is a simpler algebraic structure than a lattice. It has only one of the operators, either join or meet. But notice that liveness and available expressions do range on a complete lattice. It's just that we could solve them with less properties. Something very important is that the existence of a meet or the existence of a join operator is enough to give us an ordering relation between the elements of the lattice. In particular, we say that x is less than or equal y if the meet of x and y is x itself. Can you think about a way to prove this relation? 
Proving the relation is not very difficult. That's an equivalence relation, so we must prove that one side holds when the other is true. So for each side, we assume that it's true in turns. For instance, if we assume that x is less than or equal y, then we also know that x is less than or equal x itself. Yeah, that's always true. But in this case, x must be less than or equal the meat of x and y. But the meat of x and y is less than or equal x by definition. The other direction of the proof is even simpler. If we assume that x meets y is x, then we already know that x meet y is less than y. Therefore, x must be less than or equal y. So it's enough to have a well-defined meet or a well-defined join to have a partial order between the elements of the lattice. This partial order has three important properties. It's reflexive, anti-symmetric, and transitive. Now let's see how a semi-lattice emerges in Leibniz analysis. Consider this program on the left. From this program, we can talk about the power set of its variables. The program has three variables, x, y, and z. The power set of the set of three elements has eight elements, all the possible subsets. Then we use inclusion as the less than operator and union as the join operator. Our top element is the set with x, y, and z, and the bottom element is the end set. Now about available expressions. How does a semi-lattice emerge from that? To see how that happens, consider this program. This program contains three different expressions. a plus b, a times b, and a plus 1. The power set of this set of three expressions gives us the lattice elements. And we use intersection as the meet operator. But then, in this case, the least element is the set of all the expressions. That's the least amount of information that we have and the empty set, the top element. But then, notice that each program gives us a different lattice in our data flow analysis. If we had one more expression in this program, for instance, the lattice would be different. So let's take a look into one of these algebraic bodies, say the lattice used in Leibniz. How can we show that it really is a lattice? We can check that union is a join operator. Then we can verify that the end set is the least element of union and that S itself is the greatest set in, in union. I'm leaving some text for you in this figure. Later, if you want, you can come back to it and then check that we are really talking about a lattice. And as a further exercise, can you check that the power set plus the contains uh, operation uh, do define an ordering and the intersection as the meet operator also defines a semi lattice? We can define lattices nicely using Hess diagrams. These are directed acyclic graphs. The vertices represent the element in the lattice and the arrows represent the partial order between the elements. You can see the lattice that we had seen for Leibniz analysis on the left of the figure. And here on the right, we have la the lattice of available expressions that we had seen before, also as, as an example. Notice that in this case, the less elements a set contains, the higher it is in the partial ordering. Notice also that a solution to a data flow analysis at a given program point, at least in the examples that we had seen thus far, is a point in the underlying lattice. As an example, you can see the different program points of our example for available expressions, all mapped to some point in the lattice. Now, as a last exercise, can you take a look into these diagrams? And then, can you tell me which diagrams do not represent lattices? There are two diagrams here that are not really lattices. Can you spot them? I suggest you to pause the video to think about this question. First, we have this diagram on the top right corner. It's not a lattice because the top element is not unique. 
But there is another diagram that's also not a lattice. Would you like to think about it? I will show you the solution in the next slide. This diagram on the middle, in the bottom, is also not a, a lattice. Notice that two of the elements don't have a unique lowest upper bound. Or, put in another way, two elements don't have also a unique greatest upper bound. So that's not really a lattice. And that closes our first class about lattices. Next time, we will explain how lattices are fundamental to reason about determination of data flow analysis. Until there, feel welcome to write me with questions or comments.